welcome to Math Stat 341, lecture or day around 20. If you haven't picked up your homework, please do so. No new homework is due this next Friday. Your homework will be due the following time. There are munchkins. You can either have the munchkin to celebrate New York Yankee Elimination Day, or if you don't want to celebrate that, to commemorate the fact that we had a visitor, a prospective student in Math 317. Uh, so I was mentioning the hiccup story before class. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was teaching a crowd, I had two students who came to my office all over the And so one of them was apologizing for the fact that she couldn't stop hiccuping. And I said, oh, that, that, that's okay, I know it's not your fault. And then I waited a minute or two, and then this was a Friday, and I said, by the way, you guys got the email that Monday's midterm was moved up to today's class, right? What? So you really can scare somebody out of hiccups if you give enough of a shock to their system. It took about two minutes to convince her that the exam had not been moved, <laughs> that the exam really was still going to be on Friday. So the hiccup part did work, though. It, it really knocked the hiccups out of her system. <laughs> you know, nothing else she had tried worked, but the thought of a midterm being moved up and no longer having the weekend to study, but having it in like two hours, that, that really, really worked fast. And that's a nice segue to the marriage problem, which is yet another example of things you probably should not do. Although the hiccup story at least had a happy ending. You know, she was cured of the hiccups. I would not try that for curing people of cancer or other things like that. <laughs> you know, just be very careful as to how you. But my professor told me that this was a medically proven technique. So the marriage problem is sometimes called the secretary problem. And the way it works is you see people one at a time for a position. And the position is either to be your secretary, to be your spouse. And if you see them, you have to decide at that moment, yay or nay, do I take them or not? And we will assume you know the number of people. So you know there are n candidates. See one at a time must accept or reject immediately. If reject, they kill themselves. They cannot imagine life without you. You can weaken this to, instead of they kill themselves, they uh, unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want you know, the hookup, you know, the relapse, whatever in the relationship where people have broken up and then they get back together. For, you know, that cannot happen. Once you say no to someone, they are unavailable for all eternity. And the goal is to get the best candidate. As stated, this is a terrible problem. Imagine you have a thousand candidates, and you end up with the second best candidate. Happy or unhappy? Probably pretty happy. End up with the thousandth best candidate out of a thousand. Both of those are equal failures here. All that matters is did you end up with the best, yes or no? Now, in a real-world situation, you would want to modify this problem, right? Uh, years ago, there was a funny TV show called Mad TV. Anybody ever see or hear of this? They had a beautiful set of skits called Lowered Expectations for people who had been on the dating market for a while, and there were reasons why they were on the market for a while. I warned you, one of my students who is still single is trying to use this method to find his spouse. <laughs> Do not go up to someone and say, you know, I did a cost-benefit analysis, and I believe <laughs> that you are the best person I have a chance of getting, and I think I similarly am the best person you can get. <laughs> Would you like to spend the rest of your life with me? Probably not the best strategy. Although if they do say yes, that does beat my <laughs> So you have to be very careful as to how you maybe propose. So we will not deal with the Mechanics of how the proposal is made to the person. Okay. Happy to talk about what has worked in the past, uh, batting 100. But we will consider 
having the second best to be equally as bad as ending up with the worst person. So we have an extremely high threshold for success. And so the question, as n goes to infinity, what happens? So as you see, more, as there are more and more possible candidates, it should be harder to end up with the best person. If n equals 1, it's not that challenging, right? But as n gets larger and larger and larger, we want to know how often can somebody give me a simple strategy to choose somebody? A really simple strategy. Randomly pick one. Randomly pick one. So, In fact, it doesn't even have to be random. It could just be pick the first, pick the 17. What fraction of the time does this work? We need 1 over n, which turns to 0. So if you just do picking a fixed position, then in the limit, you will almost always lose. So the question is, can you do better than 1 over n? I guess I have a question. Like, yes. Is there like some like baseline that we're comparing to? Or like so we do not know a baseline to compare. We can rank people as they come in. So can compare to previous people. Right. So whenever somebody comes in, you can see how they compare to all the people you've seen before. But you have no idea of how good your candidate pool is better. For instance, you don't know that everybody has a score from 1 to 100, and everybody has a different score than everybody else. If that were the case, huh, you're 94. Yeah. You're 97. No, you're 100. Yes. <laughs> it would be a very easy problem in that case. You could have multiple people who are infinitesimally close to each other and hovering around 100. And then a wide gap, and then a bunch of people, you know, Amherst grads, you know, around you know, 40, and Harvard grads around 10. And then people who went to Amherst and got a PhD at Harvard and moved for the Yankees, you know, near zero. <laughs> okay. So you've seen the people one at a time. And amazingly, there is a strategy that does better than 1 over n in the limit. How much better do you think you can get? Do you think you can get like 1 over log n? or one over square root of n, or one over n to the 3 fourths? Or do you think you could even get a positive percent of the time? Like maybe 20% of the time, we can actually end up with the best person. Or is that just absurd to think we could do as well as 20%? And maybe, maybe one over square root of n, maybe some kind of square root cancellation, maybe we could do that. But to get up to you know, a positive percent of the time, that's just absurd. Does picking the fifth best person Okay. And more to the minus so, what, so you see a couple of people, and you build up a baseline. You get some sense of what the field is like. You, know, you don't tell people at the time. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, know, you, you, you act very courtly, very caring, but really you're just making some observations about you know, their value and getting a sense of what the market might be before you reject them. So you see a couple of people and then you get some sense of what the market is like. And then at some point, you decide, I'm done sampling. And then what am I going to do? Pick the first one that's better than what Pick the first one that's better than what you've seen. So sample K, choose the first one that's better. That's quite a bad strategy. What do you think k is a function of? N. n. So k is a function of n, and the probability that you end up with the best is a function of k, which means it's a function of n. And so what we want to do is we want to see what is the optimal k, and for a choice of k, what is the best percentage we can get? All right. How many people think we can get at least 1 over square root of n? 
How many think we can get all the way up to one of a login? Okay, so you think we can do that well? Because one of a login is almost a positive percent. You know, if, if n is 10 to the 100, which is a lot of people to see, you're getting better than a one in a thousand. How do you think we can even get a positive percent? Interesting, more hands for that than one over log n. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> this is violating some kind of transitivity, but... It sounds better. Yeah. It sounds better. Well, there's a lot of studies like that where uh, if you present people questions in certain ways, people are more likely to say certain things even though the probability is less just because of how it's presented. All right. So let's investigate. So you see the first K. The one, two, I've got k, k plus one, m, and then n. And m is going to be the location of the best person. Okay? I drew m to be past the first k. What's your probability of getting the best person if it's in the first k? Zero. Zero. So I don't really worry about those cases. So. If m is less equal to k, it's a fail. So this tells us, do you want k to be large or small? It's not too large. Not too large. The larger k is, the greater chance you have that m is going to be in the first k. But the smaller k is, the less of an understanding you're going to have of the market. So there's a real pull in both directions. Okay. So let's calculate the probability you get the best if you look at k. Does anybody know what kind of probability this is going to be? It's going to be a conditional probability. So we're going to sum over all the possible locations of m. n goes from k plus 1 to n. And then the probability best at m given look at first k yes so here are we making the assumption that like it's equally likely that m will be yes so we are assuming that all the candidates are uniformly distributed okay. that all all permutations are equally likely Anything else we need to multiply this by? Is this the right event? Right event. So we've got to be very careful as to how we're doing it. The probability best at the best is at m. It's terrible when you write right on the end of the blackboard. Right? That's what we really want to condition on, the location of the best. Right? And so then it's going to be given best at m. And then the probability choose best. So remember, k is fixed right now. And again, I think it's very valuable to look at wrong ways of phrasing this problem. It's very confusing at times as to what are we really looking at. We're conditioning on the location of the best. So we have to calculate two probabilities. What's the probability the best is at m? 1 over n. Like that. It's not so bad. What's the probability that the best is chosen? So what does it mean for the best to be chosen? So we didn't choose anyone before. So how would we not choose anyone before? Yes. Everything in everything before that is like 
less than or equal to everything within the first chain. Right, so the best in here has to beat the best from k plus 1 to n minus 1. And if the best in the first k beats this, then we're fine. So what's the probability that the best of the first m minus 1 is in the first k? A over n minus 1. k over n minus 1. We have n minus 1 slots. The best is equally likely to be in any of these slots. So in k of the slots, it's a success for us. In n minus 1 minus k, it's a failure. So this would be the probability that the second best person some kind of disco move, is somewhere in here. All right, so this is not a terrible sum to do. So let's consider we now need to sum n goes from k plus 1 to n of k over m minus 1 times 1 over n. So all of this should be in the book. So if you don't want to write down all the details, that's fine. This is now just doing algebra. Well, whenever you have a sum like this, it's always, well, what can I pull out? This is just going to be k over n, and in the sum, n equals k plus 1 to n of 1 over n minus 1. Anybody recognize the sum? What does the sum look like? Yeah, it looks like the harmonic. Let me spend a little time rewriting it. It's k over n, the sum n goes from k to n minus 1, 1 over n. Yeah, I don't like the n minus 1. This is the same as k over n, the sum n goes from 1 to n minus 1 of 1 over m, minus the sum n goes from 1 to k minus 1 of 1 over m. So I'm noticing that this is the harmonic series. All of our formulas for the harmonic series start with 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3. So if I'm starting not from the beginning, anybody know roughly what the harmonic series sums to? Is it divergent? It is divergent. But we do have the main term. And so, even though the harmonic series diverges, it does diverge very slowly. And so in a calculus class, you should hopefully have proven what the harmonic series converges to, uh, you know, or what its growth rate is. So 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 over n, the capital N. Does anybody know approximately what that is? I hear somebody crying, you must have not been chosen. <laughs> it's a harsh world. It's approximately the log of n. Then there's plus a constant, plus small. And the small is actually decaying with n. As a quick proof, how many of you remember the integral test? Or at least willing to raise your hand so I don't cry? <sighs> <laughs> So if you have a function that's either monotonically increasing or decreasing, you can approximate the sum with an integral. So the, you know, the sum n goes from 1 to n of 1 over n is approximately the integral from 1 to n of 1 over x dx. And that will be the log of n minus the log of 1. And the reason is, if you have a series that's monotonically decreasing like this, if I draw my boxes like this, that gets me a lower bound. If I draw the boxes like this, that gets me an upper bound. And so I can sandwich the value of the sum with the integral. And I'm going to be off by it most like the last term and the first term. And since this is growing like log n, and the terms are getting very, very small, my error is going to be very small. 
So this is a quick proof that the sum is going to look like uh, log n. With a little bit more work, you get log n plus a constant. I don't actually care what the constant is because I'm going to be adding and subtracting it. But it's the euler uh, Mastroianni constant, uh, sometimes called gamma. So for us, we have the sum n goes from 1 to uh, n minus 1 of 1 over m minus the sum n goes from 1 to k minus 1 of 1 over m. This is going to be the log of n minus 1 minus the log of k minus 1. Plus things that don't really matter, you know, things that are very small. The constant terms will cancel, and I'm going to have something that's going to be decaying with n and k. This is very similar to the birthday problem, where you know, I approximated things to get a good rough answer. All right, what's the log of a difference? So what's the difference of the logs? Divide. You divide. So this is basically the log of n minus 1 over k minus 1. And this is basically the log of n over k. Screw the minus 1s. You know, we're going to assume n is large. Right? You know, you are a Williams grant. You know, people are going to want to work for you or marry you. Right? I'm not promising that, though, because this is being recorded. So if n is large, n minus 1 over k minus 1 is approximately n over k. All right, why does this help us? Well, I'll, I'll leave the middle board, and I'll come back over here. So we get probability, we'll call it a win, is approximately equal to, we put out the k over n, and then we have the log of n over k. So what do we want to do now? What do we want to do? Figure out what the k is. Figure out what the k is. How could we do this? Derivative. Derivative. But everything's discrete. Well, that can tell us where it's closest. But how can I take a derivative of something that's discrete? What could I do? I like the idea of taking derivatives. You know, we've spent three math classes learning how to take derivatives. It's a good thing. <laughs> can anybody think of a related function? Let's look at f of x equals What might you want the variable x to be? N over, k. n over k. So this would be the log of x over x. So think x equals n over k. Remember, make sure to email me when you make comments like this. So if we take x to be n over k, this is now a function of a continuous real variable. We can do calculus. And then the hope is that the discrete maxima is near the real maxima. All right. Is it hard to take f prime of x? What rule do we have to use? Quotient. Quotient rule. All right. So it's f prime times g minus f g prime over f squared, right? Over g squared. Over g squared, sorry, over g squared. So the derivative of one of log x is one over x times x. That's the f prime g minus f g prime which is log x divided by x squared. And do we just set that equal to 0 to find the maximum? Well, it could be a minimum. Or it could be a minimum. Mm -hmm. But this is how we find the maximum minimum, correct? Yes. Yes? Tell me where I'm traveling the fastest, OK? I guess. I guess, yes. <laughs> My knees wish you could have guessed a little bit earlier. I'm getting too old for this. You also need to check the endpoints. You also have to check the endpoints. 
Okay. <laughs> so critical plus endpoints. Okay. Now in this problem, the endpoints are going to be easy. What are the endpoints? K equals one, which we know has a very low chance of success. It's only one over n. And k equals n, where we take the last person. Okay. So the endpoints, we don't really have to worry about here. It's not going to be an endpoint. But I want you to be aware of this. The following is almost surely a false story, but I love it. When they were building the stealth bomber stealth fighter, what do you think they were trying to maximize? Stealth. Stealthiness. And the joke is that they didn't check to see if they were at a max or minimum. They just looked and found a critical point. And they didn't realize until later that they were building the we're here plane. <laughs> and again, almost surely this is false. But I do like the idea of, yeah, we thought it was a little strange to be installing these loudspeakers. And <laughs> so where is f prime zero? f prime of x equals zero implies one minus log of x equals zero implies x equals e. Okay, so that means E is n over k, so k is equal to n over E. Now the question is, how close is this to the real, how close is the real maxima to the discrete maxima? So again, we're using calculus, which is wonderful. So this allows me to review material that probably has not been seen by most of you in your calculus classes. Uh, you may have noticed by now in the semester that I love trying to work in material you should have seen but have not. A lot of the material that we did when I was a kid has been removed from your textbooks for good reason. Okay? We spent a lot of time learning how to use lookup tables. You know, nowadays in the 21st century, you really don't need the lookup table as much with all the stuff that's available. How many of you did curve sketching? where you look at like the first and the second derivatives and actually get good concavity plots of things. So here's x, here's f prime of x. Remember for us, f prime of x is one minus log of x over x squared. So it is the log of e over x divided by x squared. Here is one, here's n, here's one, here's n. And the special point for us is x equals e. What's the value of the derivative at x equals z? Zero. Zero. If x is smaller than e, what can you say about the derivative? So if x is smaller than e, what can you say about the derivative? Positive. Positive. What about when x is less than e? Oh, so when x is greater than e, what can you say about the derivative? Negative. Negative. And this is the power of curve sketching. So if I look at the plot now, it's going to look something like this. So the integer maxima is going to be either immediately before or immediately after n over e. You are not always this lucky. But this tells us what the optimal value of k is. So take k to be approximately n over e. What would you like to look at now? What's the probability of yeah, what's the probability of success? So f of x, or really um, f of n over k, it is equal to k over n times the log of n over k. And we have basically e equals n over k. So what's the log of e? One. one. And if e equals n over k, then k over n equals one over e. So the probability of a win is one over e. This is one of the most shocking results I know. That in the limit, not only are you getting a positive percentile, you're doing better than 20, you're doing better than 33%. If E was 3, you'd be winning 1 out of every 3 times. You're doing better than 33%. And that's just getting the best person. 
It's shocking that you can do this well. What is extremely important to know for this problem? What n is. What n is. <laughs> so if you want to apply this, how many people are seeking your hand in marriage? How many people want employment with your company? These are really good questions to know. Uh, years ago, I had a student who gave a talk on this for his colloquium, and he chose a perfect day to do this. What day? Valentine's, Valentine's day. day. And so what he did is he said, well, what happens if you actually don't know the number of people? What if the number of people is a random variable drawn from a certain distribution? What can you say is your chance of winning? What is the optimal value to choose then? So there's a lot of nice generalizations you can do for this problem. It's a great example of conditional probability. It's a great example of piecing together an answer from a lot of simpler parts. It then allows us to use results from calculus in previous classes. You know, why do we spend all this time? Do you really care that I'm approximating k minus 1 by k and n minus 1 over the n? No. If n and k are large, this is fine. If n and k are small, like 5, mm -hmm, I'm a little hesitant. But if you only have five candidates, it's, very, it's a little bit more interesting. And then I will leave it to you to think of other problems you could ask along these lines. You know, what would be a generalization? And again, you know, the most natural one is that it is a complete failure if you end up with the second best. What might you do if you know what n is and you're searching, 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 and you still haven't found anyone? What might you do? So maybe you know n is 1,000, and you've seen 600 people, and so far you haven't seen anybody better than the first k you looked at. 700 people. 800 people. 900 people. Can you go back? No, because you said no to them. Oh, right. Right? You know, this is why I, I want the, you know, it's not that I want them to kill themselves, but I just want to drive home the point that they are unavailable. They cannot imagine life without you in it, either as their boss, their spouse, whatever. Maybe you can like say like if it's better than the second best person in the first, or the third best person. So you might start to have a switch that at some critical point, lower your standards. you're willing to lower your standards. <laughs> and then again, you have to be very diplomatic about how you uh, say this. When you're hiring candidates, do you tell the candidate you're our third choice? No, you show them the love. So you're not supposed to, oh yeah, uh, yeah, the other people all said no to us. <laughs> We're not sure why. <laughs> so you really want to think about how do you want to present information to people. And you really want to think, at what point do you start to cut your losses? So a lot of great stuff on this. All right. Any questions on the marriage secretary problem? And again, I am happy to talk to you about ways to try to ask people to marry you. I do not recommend the cost-benefit analysis approach. <laughs> How many of you have seen the two and more problem? Oh, I've heard of this one. So in the old days, I would actually bring in two envelopes, but then there's a danger that this could now uh, create more waste for the planet, and so we'll just consider two generic theoretical envelopes. In one envelope, you have x dollars, and in the other envelope, you have two x dollars. And you can see how much money is in each envelope, and you have to choose one. So, what envelope will you choose? Yeah, you choose the one that has more. <laughs> this is not a very interesting problem. Let's make it interesting. You know that one envelope has double the other. But you don't know which. So let's say you choose an envelope and you open it. And you see it has D dollars. If you stay with this envelope, what's your expected value? Mm -hmm. D. If stay, expected value is D. What if you
you switch. So let's calculate the expected value. What would be the expected value? So how often do you get d over 2? So half the time you get d over 2, and the other half the time you get? 2. Well, already the half 2d is equal to d. So this is greater than d. What do you do? So do we have to actually look inside this envelope? No, so we don't, we don't look inside. So if we take this envelope, it's in our best interest to switch. Well, let's look at this envelope. Let's use some letter, E, next letter in the alphabet to represent how much money we have in it. If we do the exact same calculation, what should we do? Okay. <laughs> so I like doing this after the marriage problem, where the marriage problem is all about being decisive and choosing. And now this is indecisive and we go into this infinite loop. What do we, what's, what's wrong? We're spending all eternity. It's always in our best interest to switch. So problems like this always have something subtly wrong. That they're trying to slip by you. But by doing this expected value, my expected value is positive from switching. Because each envelope is equally likely to have the lower amount, it's equally likely to have the higher amount. But if you already know that the other envelope has the lower amount. But we're not looking inside the envelope. We just did the calculation. There's some amount of money in this envelope. Isn't the expected value just take account the envelope you've already seen? But we're not even looking at the envelope. We don't even have to look at the envelope. So we're just going back and forth. Yeah, so if I've already seen this problem. Okay, you've already seen it. Uh, so a lot of times people are upset with the amount of emphasis mathematicians place on rigor and being very careful and very concrete in describing what's going on. Years ago, I generalized and extended a physics paper. I actually asked one of my colleagues about this paper and I said, it's been a while since I've done physics. Is this well written in physics literature or is this poorly written? Actually, this is poorly written. Um, they're not being clear about what their probability space is and everything like this. So I'm choosing two values from a, you know, from a set of numbers. What set of numbers am I drawing it from? Well, I'm really assuming I'm drawing it from zero infinity. And I want all values to be equally likely. This is the uniform distribution on zero infinity. Is there a uniform distribution on zero infinity? Can't do that. I need a finite interval. If it's zero to a thousand, then my density function is one over a thousand from zero to a thousand. If it's one to a million, it's zero to a million, it's one over a million from zero to a million. And that will integrate to one. I can't put on a uniform distribution on zero infinity. And so if I want to say all values are equally likely, well, if the distribution has some bounded, some bounded support, let's say there's some large value B, then at some point, you know, especially if you know what that value is, if I see a number that's greater than what? One half B. One half B, I'm stopping. So that's the subtle thing that's going wrong over here. Okay. Any questions about the two envelope problem? Yes? So for like small values of D, like how do you reconcile like well, and, and, and that's the question is you would need to have some thoughts, some information about what the distribution is. So if you don't, you just switch forever. Right? Well, you, you If you have a fixed value of b, um, now you start to have some information. And you can start to ask, is it more likely or less likely that this is the larger or the smaller value? And so for instance, if b is 1,000 and you observe 5, 
you think it's more likely or less likely that five is the smaller value? So you could probably try to do something like that. All right, so we have about 10 minutes left. I want to try to do uh, the Buffon needle problem. So I think I explained the Buffon needle problems before. So you have these parallel grids that are d units apart, and you have some rod of length L. And you throw the rod down, and you want to ask, what is the expected number of intersections of the rod? I will assume L is less than D, so the rod can hit at most one line. Yes, it's possible the rod lands perfectly aligned. That happens with probability zero. So the first thing to notice is this problem has a lot of symmetry. It doesn't really matter up and down where the rod lands. So if you want, you might as well assume, you know, here are my lines, that the center of the, that the rod lands somewhere with its center on the x-axis. And let's assume the rod lands at some point where this distance is x, and it lands at some angle theta. And you want to calculate as a function of x and theta, what is the probability that you have an intersection? And you'll have at most one intersection. So what's the range for x? 0 less than equal to x less than equal to how large can x go? D. It could be d. Absolutely correct to do d. But I claim by using symmetry, you can do better. Say d over 2. d over 2. Because if it lands on the other side, they just flip things. So this is going to be my probability space. 0 less than equal to x less than equal to d halves. What about theta? 0 less than equal to theta less than equal to. So I start off with theta equals 0. Right? I can go up to 90. Could I keep going like this? Or is it really the same as the metric? Yeah, so I, I think I can go. And so my density function, f of x theta, is going to be 1 over d halves times pi halves, or 4 over pi d. And now you can begin to see why this might be related to you know, finding a way to calculate pi is pi is coming in. So we have to calculate now what is the probability that we hit as a function of x and d. Well, what's the furthest out we can go for x and have a chance of hitting? Really, 0 less than equal to x less than equal to Not d. So we know it can go up to at most d halves. And we know the length is less than d. So I claim that if x is too large, there's no chance of a hit. Because you know, this is where the center is hitting. How far can the center go? L over 2. L over 2. So remember to email me. L over 2. Because if it goes past L over 2, even if the angle is 0, that's the fastest way I can get to one of the grid lines. I can't make it. And then, for a given value of x between 0 and L over 2, there will be a value of theta that works. You know, I can take theta equals 0, and then I can go down a little bit. And then the question is, how far can I take theta and still have a hit? So here's 0. Here's d over 2, here's l over 2, um, and let's say here's some point x. And then the best is if it just hits down here. So the hypotenuse would be l over 2, this would be x. How would we calculate the angle? Yeah, we want to use some kind of trigonometry. So, 
So I was technically saying that you know, this is what I'm calling theta. Well, that's the same as the theta down here. And so how would you get that angle theta? So cosine theta is equal to x divided by L over 2, or 2x over L. It might be easier to use the angle down here. I don't know. I just want to show you a messy, nasty integral. Do I integrate first with respect to x or with respect to theta? So am I first fixing x and then choosing theta, or first th fixing theta and then choosing x? First choosing, first choosing x. Given a value of x, this tells me how far I can go. So x goes from 0 to L halves. Theta goes from 0, ah, wonderful, ah, cosine of 2x over L. The integrand is at least nice. The integrand is 4 over pi d d theta dx. All right, in the interest of fairness, I will do one integral and leave you the other. I will do the theta integral. This just gets the integral from, actually I can pull out the 4 over pi d. The integral x goes from 0 to L halves. And then I just get arc cosine of 2x over L dx. And I will leave that as an exercise. So, yeah, you got to find the integral of the arc cosine, right? So it's a nice exercise. Figure out, try to see if you can do this. How could you find the answer? This is the 21st century. Search it, Google, right? You know, plug in antiderivative arc cosine or go to a website on arc cosine and you will find it. Look at a table of series and integrals. When I was in college, I was told by one of my physics professors that every good physics student had two tables of integrals. A small one that they kept on them at all times and a big massive monster that you left in your room. Times have changed, <laughs> okay? But you got a good lot of exercise. Um, Maybe I'll bring in my table of integrals at one point. There is a faster way to do this problem. So the great Paul Erdős has many wonderful sayings. One of his is you do not need to believe in God to be a mathematician, but you have to believe in the book. So the book is a collection of the best, most elegant proofs of all results. And the highest praise you can give a mathematician is, you know, that's a proof from the book. And in fact, a couple of mathematicians then wrote a book called Proofs from the Book, where they collected what they thought were some of the best proofs of some great results in mathematics. If you're ever looking for a colloquium topic, this is a wonderful source for all these, you know, like these aha moments. So here is the proof from the book of Buffon's needle. Instead of dropping rod of length L, I'm going to essentially use linearity of expectation. I'm going to do this really fast. If I drop a bunch of small rods, and add each one of them up, that's the same as dropping a larger rod. And I want to consider all the possible angles. So I'll drop a rod like this, then 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 like this, etc., etc., etc. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a circle. And I'm going to choose the diameter of the circle perfectly so that the diameter of the circle is, what do you think? D, yes. D for diameter, D for the distance. How many points of intersection will you have? Two. two. And in fact, no matter how you draw such a circle, it's always going to have two points of intersection. So if you draw n, um, disks, how many points of intersection do you expect to have? Now, the formula what is the length of the disk? Its perimeter is going to be 2 pi d. Right? Pi d? Pi d. Uh, sorry, pi d. Sorry, pi d. I'm so used to doing. 
previous thank you. Now I claim the answer is a constant times L over D. That as I rescale things, and so I'm going to leave it like this, and to have you then put the pieces together to see how you can get that it's going to involve your know, pi and get you a nice proof. I'll send the proof from the book later, you know, so that if you want, you can you know, just look it up. But it's absolutely amazing that this comes up. And there is a wonderful example of somebody who claims to have done this experiment and calculated pi to eight digits. And what somebody noticed is, interesting, the number n you chose is the denominator of a wonderful rational approximation to pi. And if you had dropped just one more stick, no matter how it landed, you would have lost five digits of accuracy. So we're not accusing you of cheating. We're merely stating so two of my friends actually dropped out of college for a year or two to help the amazing James Randi set up his institute to, to debunk claims of magical powers. And Randi was sued many times by Yuri Geller, who can bend spoons with his mind. And I believe the language he now has to use is, if he's using his mind, he's doing it the hard way. And you, he can show how to bend a spoon as well, just by pretending. And there's incredible things you can do with sleights of hand. So whenever you see data, especially if the data is too good, I want you to be suspicious. Always be asking yourself, who is giving me this data and why are they choosing this data to give? Why did they choose to drop this number of sticks? Ah, interesting, this number of sticks happens to correspond to the denominator of a really good. So that's a good place to end.